Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is the holiest day of the year for Jews. From sundown Yom Kippur Eve until nightfall the next day, Jews around the world pray in synagogue, repent, and fast from eating and drinking. In Israel, the roads are empty, the stores are closed, the country comes to a virtual standstill. That was the scene in Israel in the fall of 1973, when the Yom Kippur War broke out, catching the state of Israel off guard and unprepared. From the beginning, the Yom Kippur War was a national catastrophe with massive casualties. So how did Israel almost lose the Yom Kippur War, and how did they eventually overcome what looked to many like certain defeat? Let's set the stage. Prior to 1973, Egypt and Israel had already fought four wars in a span of about 20 years. The 1948 Arab-Israeli War, the 1956 Suez War, the 1967 Six-Day War, and the lesser-known War of Attrition during 1969 and 1970. In 1967, after Egyptian tank divisions moved into Sinai in preparation for battle, Israel launched a surprise preemptive airstrike on Egyptian airfields, crippling Egypt's air force. Israelis secured a stunning victory in only six days. In what began as a defensive war, Israel conquered the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, the Sinai Peninsula, and the Golan Heights, leaving the Jewish state with territory three times its previous size. Following that defeat, eight Arab heads of state convened at a summit in Sudan where they passed the Khartoum Resolution, known for its three no's. No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, no negotiations with Israel. Meanwhile, the Cold War was heating up, along with the threat of nuclear war. Both global superpowers, the US and the Soviet Union, were sticking their noses in conflicts all over the world, trying to spread their spheres of influence. In the Middle East, the Soviets backed the Egyptians and Syrians, while the US backed the Israelis. As a result, Israel's adversaries from the Six Day War got some new toys to play with. The Egyptians and Syrians received new Soviet tanks, planes, and highly advanced shoulder-launched anti-aircraft missiles, weapons they didn't have in 1967. But this didn't phase the Israelis, particularly Defense Minister Moshe Dayan. After such an overwhelming victory in 1967, a mindset of self-assurance and complacency took hold in Israel. Dayan and much of the Israeli brass were convinced that Arab countries wouldn't dare start another war, that the devastation and shame from six years earlier was still too fresh. That attitude in Israel, which in later years would be referred to as the Concepcia, wasn't lost on Anwar Sadat, Egypt's recently elected president. Both Sadat and Syrian President Hafez al-Assad were ruling countries that they felt had lost their honor and dignity with the defeat of 1967. And to make matters worse, the defeat came at the hands of Israel, a tiny country that many of Arabs felt had no right to exist in the region. Before Sadat would ever consider coming to the negotiating table with Israel to discuss peace, many believed he first needed to reclaim Egypt's honor. On the other hand, Syria's President al-Assad never concerned himself with the idea of negotiating. His stance on Israel was clear, wipe it off the map. For Sadat, starting a war had already been the plan for at least a year prior to Yom Kippur of 1973. Since then, he had set about lulling Golda and the Israelis into a false sense of security and complacency. How though? Well, he managed this ruse using two very different and very clever approaches. On the one hand, to give the appearance that all was well, he sent emissaries to the US to discuss diplomatic ties with Israel while on the other hand, he repeatedly held threatening military exercises near the border with Israel without ever actually carrying out any operations, creating a sort of boy who cried wolf perception. Despite Sadat's mind games, the Israelis did have signs and even direct warnings that war was on the horizon. In the days leading up to the war, the Soviets withdrew their diplomats from Syria, an indication that they were expecting a war to break out. Not only that, but a close confidant of Sadat's turned Israeli spy warned the Israelis that war was imminent. That spy was none other than the son-in-law of former Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser. He went by the not-so-subtle codename, The In-Law, or sometimes the more glamorous codename, The Angel. So this would appear to be prime reliable intelligence. But after a few false alarms, his latest warnings were dismissed. And by the time the Israelis took his warning seriously, it was just too late. But these weren't the only warnings. 10 days before the war, King Hussein of Jordan secretly flew to a Mossad building just outside of Tel Aviv to meet with Golda Meir face to face. Hussein warned Golda that war was imminent on two fronts with Egypt and Syria set to strike in tandem. He wasn't just doing it out of the goodness of his heart though, he was eager to avoid a war, fearing that it would draw Israeli troops into Jordan. So this is the part where Israel's leaders begin mobilizing the troops and preparing for war, right? Unfortunately, no. The Israelis still remained unconvinced, doubting whether the Jordanians even believed their own warning. Golda, under the advice of her generals and advisors, declined to mobilize the troops. She had other legitimate considerations as well. For a country the size of Israel, 
roughly 3 million people, calling up tens of thousands of reservists could cripple the economy. Later though, Golda would confess that her intuition told her trouble lay ahead, but she still chose to lay back and wait. Spoiler, her intuition was right. On October 5th, 1973, the day before Yom Kippur, it finally became all too clear that the Egyptians would strike. For Golda, the question now became not only whether to mobilize, but whether to strike first like Israel had done so successfully in 1967. Her fateful answer was no, they would not preemptively strike. They would also only mobilize on a very limited scale, and this decision would ultimately haunt her. But why didn't Golda pull a 67 and strike first, or even fully mobilize? Well, for one, Golda was wrapped up in the optics of the situation. She didn't want the international community to label the Israelis as the aggressors. She, Dayan, and others reasoned that even simply mobilizing the troops, let alone launching an airstrike, before a single shot was fired, could give them that appearance. Another factor was the strong recommendation not to strike first, given by Israel's key ally, the United States. Then President Richard Nixon and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger essentially demanded that Israel stand down. So they did. And then Yom Kippur. Shortly after 2 p.m. on the afternoon of Yom Kippur, military couriers burst into synagogues and Jews throughout Israel learned that Egypt and Syria had just launched a surprise attack on the state. The messengers read out names of men who were being called up. Men rushed out of services, prayer shawls still draped over them. They hadn't had anything to eat or drink the whole day. The following day, most of the called up reservists would reach the front lines. All in all, the timing of the attack was a bit of a double-edged sword. Yes, it was Yom Kippur and the IDF couldn't use phones or radio to get a hold of reservists, but on the other hand, it was Yom Kippur. Everyone was in synagogue, which made it easy to locate people. Also, roads were empty, making it super easy for couriers to get around and for reservists to deploy. And so began the Yom Kippur War, one of the darkest periods in Israeli history. But let's back up. How did the actual attack go down? Well, at 2 p.m. Yom Kippur afternoon, Egypt and Syria launched airstrikes and artillery barrages against Israel. Simultaneously, the Egyptians rapidly launched ferries and laid bridges across the Suez Canal. 70,000 Egyptian troops and over 2,000 tanks crossed the canal where they came face to face with Israel's Bar Lev Line, a chain of fortifications stationed along the canal. The Bar Lev Line was considered by many as a symbol of Israeli military perfection, able to withstand 24 to 48 hours of direct assault. But it wasn't. To the Israelis' shock, Egyptian forces cut through the Bar Lev Line in only a few hours. Over the next two days, the Egyptians demolished this chain of fortifications. And there was another unwelcome surprise. In previous wars, Israel's huge tactical advantage was that its powerful air force could give cover to ground forces. But in this war, Egypt's new surface-to-air missiles, courtesy of the Soviets, rendered the Israeli air force virtually powerless. The Egyptians overwhelmed the Israelis on that first day, outgunning them 40 to 1 in ammunition, backed up with 6 to 1 in manpower. They rolled out 2,000 tanks to Israel's 268. In the north, 40,000 Syrian troops and 1,500 tanks stormed the Golan Heights, facing off against a mere 177 Israeli tanks. With Israel reeling, other Arab states didn't want to miss out on the fun. Iraq quickly joined the war effort, sending 14,000 soldiers. Lebanon fired missiles. Jordan, which had tried to warn Israel about the war, sent a brigade to Syria to avoid being labeled an outcast by the Arab world, but they kept Israel informed of their actions. To put it mildly, things were not going well on Israel's borders. But what was happening on the home front? Well, at 6 o'clock in the evening at the end of Yom Kippur, Golda spoke on the radio. She told Israelis matter-of-factly that Egypt and Syria had attacked Israel and that a fierce battle was taking place. For Dayan and Golda, that first day was surreal, and things only further deteriorated. Dayan's overconfidence quickly gave way to severe anxiety. He even wanted Golda to consider surrendering territory to the Egyptians. He was heard murmuring apocalyptic proclamations about the end of the third Jewish commonwealth. Golda refused to let him speak on the radio, fearing he would freak the public out and create widespread panic. This was a trying time for Golda, who instantly regretted her sit back and wait approach as she watched the nightmare scenario play out. Behind closed doors, she too was stressed and overcome with anxiety. But for the sake of her people, Golda maintained an outward appearance of resilience and keeping her cool. Putting on a brave face is one thing, but the reality was, Israel was on the ropes. For Golda, it felt like the walls were closing in. Make no mistake, there was no guarantee Israel would come out of this alive. Dayan, fearing the worst, even raised the idea of using nuclear weapons. Golda refused to give in to Dayan's fatalism and took that suggestion right off the table. She maintained constant dialogue with Kissinger, hopeful US intervention could turn the tide. 
but desperation began to set in. Things in Central Command looked downright hopeless. So what was the Israeli public's reaction? They knew that hundreds were dying, with more reported every day. And in a country just shy of three million, pretty much everyone knew someone serving. An entire nation waited with bated breath for news about their loved ones. And it became a matter of placing hope in their leader, Golda Meir. Would she rise to the challenge? Would Israel survive the war? Stay tuned for episode two and find out how this story unfolded. <laughs>